Welcome everybody and thank you for joining um, for this session. Um, please do introduce yourself in the chat so we know who we've got in the room, um, particularly since we have such a, a small group that, that might mean we've got a bit more um, scope to have a, a conversation later than we anticipated. Um, and let us know when you, as you do what you're hoping to learn about um, today. Um, I'm John Harl and I'll, I'll be moderating um, the session. I'm the director of programmes for INAF, which is an international NGO um, that over the last 30 years has been working with partners um, across the world to make research in higher education systems more equitable in different ways. Um, I'd like to um, firstly introduce my um, three colleagues who will um, hopefully turn their microphones on so you can see them as I do so, um, and their, um, their camera, sorry. Um, first, um, Dr. Tupo uh, Ivagar, who's a lecturer in the Faculty of Science and Technology um, in the Department of Computing Science Studies at Mzumba University in Tanzania. Uh, next, Gloria Monko, who is Assistant Lecturer at the University of Dodoma in Tanzania. Um, and uh, last but not least, Dr. Walter Odongo, who is Senior Lecturer and Community Engagement Coordinator in the Faculty of Agriculture and Environment at Uli University in Uganda. Um, I don't know if you can uh, put your camera on Walter so everyone sees where you are. Um, most of the next hour we're going to devote to a panel discussion. Um, so we'd welcome any questions that you have um, for us as we do so or that are prompted by the conversation in the chat box and we'll try and pick as many of those up as we can. Um, and we'll also be launching a few Mentimeter polls um, so there's, there's a chance for those to tell us a bit about what you think about the issues we'll be dealing with. Um, and the first Menti um, should be accessible in a moment, Patrick, if you wouldn't mind putting it up. Um, and that's to ask you, what are the two biggest challenges you face in your teaching? And there's a link there, if you click, that should take you straight to the Menti. You do introduce yourself in um, the chat as well. Um, I can see we've got um, Samantha um, joining um, from Maryland, um, from the Center for Education in the USA. Student, uh, student apathy and large and um, classified and stuff. Um, one particular challenge. Any others coming up? I'm not sure if we'll take a few moments before they appear on the um, screen. Any of the challenges that you that you face in your teaching um, gives us a, a a kind of sense of of what what kind of common issues we might all be facing here, um, and how we might be able to um, uh, what we talk about. Um, shortly might, might offer some um, strategies to address those. Any more um, thoughts on the biggest um, challenges facing you in your, in your teaching? Looks like we might have a, a bit of a time lag. Don't, I mean, don't, um, don't um, overthink this. Just, you know, what, what are the first things that come into your mind uh, when you think about stepping into the classroom or the last time you stepped into a classroom if you're not um, currently teaching what were the biggest challenges that you faced um, and welcome any of our panelists as well if they want to um, offer any of the challenges they've been facing um, looks like we might uh, not have so many um, um, suggestions here. Lots of that's a problem with the mentee. Let's um, let's uh, move on um, and um, uh, and before we move to the oh no we've got a couple coming through. So, so delivering relevant um, uh, teaching to learners, relevant classes. It's another there um, and a comment in the chat box from the, um, from Ben saying. The faculty with whom he with whom he works um, 
often talk about um, challenges of introducing student-centred practices into the classroom. That's an interesting one. I think that's one we've all encountered as well. Um, some resistance sometimes. Let's let's move on then to the um, next part of the session, which um, before we turn to the panel, we want to tell you a bit more um, about the model that our partnership has uh, been developing. Um, and we have some uh, slides just to walk you through that. Um, so uh, next uh, slide, please, Patrick. Um, so our um, uh, model is a result of um, a partnership over the last four or five years or so um, of four universities, that those are the universities of Dodoma and Mozambique in Tanzania, uh, at Uganda Master University and Gulu University in Uganda. Um, a network of um, faculty developers in Kenya um, called ADULT, the Association for Faculty Enrichment in Learning and Teaching, Ashoka East Africa, which is the social entrepreneurship network and the East African hub, and INAF um, uh, based in the UK. Um, and the model really is um, a collection of tools for faculty members um, and university leaders to guide the process of performing teaching and learning at their institutions. Um, and the intent is that these resources um, will, will support um, and have supported faculty to teach for critical thinking and problem solving skills. Um, so that students are, are learning how to think and not what to think, so that um, communities and employers are made part of that process of um, developing curricula and thinking about the entire teaching uh, process and environment. And so that curricula are then are much more relevant um, and are preparing students for the lives and the careers that they will lead uh, beyond university, um, whether that's in business, in the public sector, or even civic and, um, and community roles they may play. And so that learning environments become more inclusive and are therefore providing spaces where, where um, all students can learn equally. Um, and importantly too, that um, a set of tools that enable um, academics and students to make the changes together um, and for university leadership to um, support that in various ways. Um, we've developed and tested it working um, together as a partnership over the last few years. Um, so it's been uh, piloted, tested and advised several times. Um, and Patrick, if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, And our starting point was that um, many approaches to curriculum and pedagogical reform are borrowed from the North, from universities in North America or in Europe, and then are adapted to, in this case, East African context. And we wanted to turn that approach on its head. So it was we developed and firmly rooted in East Africa and it began with the university, which I'm going to introduce you to soon, or at least the representative. Um, and it was all about thinking what, what are their nations and their communities and their economies need. Uh, and we followed a rigorous process of um, pedagogical training, course redesign, taking cohorts of lecturers through that process. Um, and uh, students were involved uh, very closely from the um, start as lecturers started to pilot new approaches to teaching and um, new curricula in the classroom and see how they worked in practice. And the results have been very positive. So in our internal evaluations, we had um, 91% uh, of academics who were um, reporting that they were now using gender responsive pedagogies, 80% um, reporting that they used critical thinking techniques in their um, classrooms, in their teaching. The 87% of students had a positive experience of these new teaching and learning methods, which was significant given we did encounter some resistance and some um, discomfort amongst um, students early on. And um, it's also proved uh, pretty resilient um, despite the shocks of um, the pandemic and campus closures, and in some cases that actually proved more in demand um, as, as learning had to very rapidly um, adjust to that environment. Uh, next slide, please. So what's been particularly important is that we've centered the students throughout. So we wanted to make sure that this is about creating a meaningful learning experience for um, students and by exposing them to diverse perspectives and, uh, and encouraging them to think for themselves. And we did this by focusing on key skills that um, students would need um, 
and supporting academics to teach for critical thinking and teach for problem solving skills. And we put an approach to gender responsive pedagogy right at the heart uh, to make sure that we were making spaces much more inclusive in the process so that women and men are able to participate and to learn and to thrive during their, their university lives. And that became a jumping off point to make um, other changes at the institutional level. So the institution then started to adapt um, policy processes and practice um, for a more inclusive learning environment that was sponsored by the conversations that began um, to the teaching practices which we were introducing. Uh, next slide, please. So many approaches to curriculum development also begin with what the academics know. They're the experts and what they then think their um, students need to know. But we wanted to approach it differently. So we convened um, groups of lecturers, um, students too, with local businesses, employer bodies, representatives of the community, uh, national policy makers, what we call joint advisory groups. And we asked them, what, what are the skills and the competencies that our graduates need? And, and how can you help us to develop better graduates for you in the future? Um, and that created opportunities for students to meet employers and for faculty to meet employers and to discuss their learning challenges and expectations and to get um, feedback and advice. And many of the stakeholders then became involved in the design of particular curricula and departments, um, and in some cases in the delivery of those courses through guest lectures or through student projects or internship placements or being involved in other kind of practical um, assignments and learning activities. Next slide, please. And we, we started at the course level because we wanted to make much more rapid improvement and to see how that was possible without getting snared up in, in very long processes of curriculum review. Um, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be used above the course level and we think actually this could support the, the redesign um, and the rethinking of entire programs. But the emphasis there was on giving faculty the, the tools and the ideas and the confidence that they could make some changes one semester, um, change their courses, rethink their courses and take them into the classroom the next semester so that they were getting feedback much, much more quickly than they might usually do. And students began to see the change to uh, much more see that and ultimately benefited from um, improved teaching and improved learning spaces. Next slide, please. So um, we developed a range of um, courses, um, online courses, toolkits and case studies that are particularly designed to support lecturers and in, in institutions to lead this process, um, and particularly in um, settings where resources might be limited and um, the various challenges of um, time and facilities. Um, and there's some links on the screen that you can access those through um, if you go to transformhe.org. Um, but we're going to talk to you much more now about what this meant in practice um, through a panel conversation. Um, we'll, and we'll try the next Menti 2 now. Um, let's see if that um, gets some more responses. Uh, Patrick, if you could just give us a link to the next Menti, that would be great. So the link on the, on the screen now um, to the next mentee. Um, and as we move into the um, panel discussion, um, we wanted to ask you, you know, what's, what is most important to you in your classroom or in the classrooms um, and the and learning environments you've been involved in? Uh, and there's a few options for you to pick there. Um, and if you should let you rank them in turn, So um, and particularly the sort of top result here that um, students are doing practical projects or assignments as part of their course. That's come very strongly. Um, secondly, that students are asking questions um, and discussing what they're learning. And, and perhaps um, important but least important of the three is that students are listening well and taking good notes. So I think this is, this is interesting because there's a, a consensus here about um, student engagement, I think, in the learning process. Um, well, that's just um, shifting as we speak, so maybe it's not, not such a strong consensus. Um, we're going to turn now to our panel, um, and I'm going to invite um, Tupo 
um, Gloriana and Walter to um, just put their cameras on if, if I can briefly. Um, and um, in turn, I'm going to ask each of them a series of questions. We'll do it in um, three rounds. Our first round is going to look at the course redesign process. Um, second part of the panel will look at um, inclusive learning and how we approach that. And the third will move to um, community engagement and engagement with um, employers in, in different ways. So um, I'll turn to Tupo, I'll turn to you first. Um, what do you do? How do you make teaching more relevant to, um, to your learners at Mazambé? Um, thank you, John. Uh, actually, there are various ways that I use so as to make teaching and learning more relevant to my students. But then the most important ones for me are, first of all, whenever I have the course outline, I have to try to make it current uh, to make sure that it captures like current issues or current trends so that students can make sense of whatever that they are learning and then try to relate with whatever that is happening into the world. But then the second thing that normally I consider it important, especially to increase the relevance of my teaching and learning to my students is the issue of including uh, practitioners from the industry. So normally I ask some for professional from the industry to come into the class, deliver a guest lecture, or sometimes demonstrate some things which we have already covered in class. So this makes my students to feel more like it makes the topic or the concept more relevant. And finally, another thing which I use is uh, the use of local, local example, like you use local cases. This is very important because then the student can try to relate with whatever that is happening to their community. Yeah. Thanks, Jupiter. Could you tell us a bit more then about, about how you've made those kind of practical um, parts of the, um, the learning uh, work for your uh, students? When it comes to uh, the practical, let's say maybe how I normally engage my students, especially uh, using these uh, local scenarios or local case studies, what I normally do is, uh, first of all, I want, I want my students, I try to do that to make them apply and integrate whatever that they have learned in class to what is happening into the society. So this can be either before the introduction of the concept or through uh, understanding of the concept, even at the end of the concept. But the most important thing is that they have to relate and try to integrate and apply whatever they have learned in class to what is happening to the environment. But then in the past two years, I've been trying to go with another approach of uh, learn by doing, whereby when I start, uh, let's say a class on the first day, what I normally do is uh, I make sure that my students actually uh, they are given a certain project that they have to partake throughout the course. And then this helps them to, to understand. And of course, it also creates a more uh, like a relevance of the course to them because now they'll be learning by doing. So this is normally how I apply it. Thanks, Jupo. Um, I'm going to turn to, uh, turn to Gloriana now. Um, Gloriana, how have you helped your um, um, students learn to think and, and learn to solve problems through their... Um, involvement in your classes. Uh, Gloriana, are you hearing us? We can't, we can't hear you yet. My internet. I think, uh, I think you're cutting out at the moment. Um, let me just turn to Walter then. Uh, let's see if uh, Walter's um, Nice letter, Walter. Um, Ogliarana, um, reconnect. Um, how have your students uh, responded to um, new ways of teaching and learning? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, for students, uh, new ways of teaching and learning. Hello, John. Uh, hi, Gloriana. Just, uh, just a moment. We can hear you now. Walter is just going to uh, pick up the mic for a few moments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I was saying yes to students in new changes in teaching methods, new ways of teaching and learning is, is foreign to them. And uh, normally um, you find they're uncomfortable. Uh, they feel uncomfortable with it. So the first, uh, you know, the first thing you see, you find is resistance to change. 
where they don't want to, you know, venture into uh, what they're not very sure about, you know. So when you change the approach, they tend to, to resist it, to, you know, that is their immediate reaction. You know, they also keep, you know, comparing because you're changing from one, what they know, the conventional, the, the student, the, the um, uh, teacher-centered approach, and then you're moving more maybe to a student-centered approach, then they compare. This is what we're used to, and this is a new situation. So normally you meet the resistance and trying to move back and forth between the conventional and the new approaches to teaching and learning. So how do you counter that resistance that you experience then from your, uh, from your students? You know, knowing the, the importance of the new changes, the changes in teaching and learning, the new approaches, the, the, the one thing that I do is to insist and make it very clear to the students that that is the way things are going to go. And you know, when, 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 when you insist and you start giving them real life experiences, real life examples, for instance, making them work in groups, which is normally a natural learning environment. You find students, weaker students, getting help from the more brighter, you know, stronger students in class. When, for instance, you use problem-based learning, you know, give students to, you know, uh, gain confidence when they make presentations in class, they gain self-esteem. At the end of the day, they, they tend to accept it. And when they accept, they feel, you know, they feel they're important, they feel relevant in the class and being able to contribute to their own learning processes makes actually the students more, more comfortable and more appreciative of the course. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of um, sticking with it and, and trusting that um, students will see the benefit ultimately. And Gloriana, uh, I think we've lost Gloriana completely from the call. So um, let me go to our uh, next set of questions. Um, and if you have uh, questions in the audience or things you'd like to pick up on please do put them in the um in the in the chat um uh, tupo um let me turn to you next um we want to think now about um inclusive learning and gender responsive pedagogy um in what in what ways do you find that um learners can be excluded from your um, and for your classrooms and what have you done in the Zumbe to try and um, uh, tackle that? Uh, I think there, are, there could be various ways that learners can be excluded, especially female learners. Especially, I'm, I'm talking on my experience now, especially on my class, uh, because the course that I teach, the courses that I normally teach are information system causes. And basically these causes, they are normally, uh, the enrollment of female is actually lower compared to the enrollment of male. So you find that most of female are somehow excluded. And then also they feel, they're not that much comfortable, I would say, even responding to questions in class. So this is somehow challenging. But then what we normally do is, what I normally do personally, is I normally try to make sure that I engage them in class for those who are actually managed to uh, get enrolled into my programs. I will try to engage them as much as possible. For example, uh, while engaging them in class, pointing them where necessary, but then also try to make them feel part of the process. For example, what I normally do is when I use examples, or sometimes if we are watching a video, I will try also to include uh, videos or maybe examples which uh, represent let's say a female so that they can somehow understand or feel like okay we are also part of this we are also part of this process uh, for instance if i want let's say to talk about a uh, data warehouse and then i would try to look for a female uh, a female person who a female who is actually representing let's say a certain concept about data warehouse i feel like this makes them more comfortable and feel like okay we as female, we can also do this. If this person can post maybe let's say a video on YouTube to be confident enough and explain this, they can also do that. So these are some of the things that I do uh, so as to ensure that uh, female learners are also like included into my class and also feel comfortable on the journey. Yes. Thank you, Tupo. Um, I think um, Gloriana might, might be back now. So let me turn to Gloriana. Can you hear us, Gloriana, and can you? Yes, yes, I can hear John. Okay, okay. Um, so, my video. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, we're on we're um, talking about um, gender responsive pedagogy in inclusive learning spaces now. So, um, from your experiences at UDOM, how do you think we can make um, classrooms teaching more inclusive? And what have you done at UDOM um, to address that? Okay. Um, responding to us that question, one thing I would say, like the first thing that we need we needed to do is to actually see on the issues that can hinder the uh, the the equitable education for both girls and uh, boys students or male and female students. So we had to look at the issues that can actually uh, the the hidden gender biases in curricula and be able to, to see if the curriculums are not really speaking to the learners, if they are not making the, uh, the environment more inclusive. So after that, we had to, to seek for the necessary initiatives on how we can create a more equitable our learning environment. So that was one of our approach. And we realized that these gender aspects are very important to consider when designing the curriculums and also when designing the teaching and learning activities for our students. So uh, as UDOM, we decided to make it as our, our culture, to inculcate it in our culture and our daily practices on how we interact with our students in the class and outside the class. So uh, for instance, uh, before uh, you know, having this uh, gender responsive uh, aspect in, in our practices, we could literally do things without understanding. Probably uh, I'm taking myself as an example, probably I could do things differently in the class without understanding, like becoming our conscious and unconscious bias uh, while teaching my students, for instance, picking boys or uh, picking girls more in the class rather than the other gender. So how do we make these two or uh, uh, two students, I mean, the, the, the both students get more chances on airing their opinions Become inculcating this uh, uh, this in their own culture and feel confident be, uh, among each other, be able to exchange ideas when they are in group discussions. So we had to create an environment that can actually make these students be able to exchange ideas. For instance, if you find them in the class, they are seated in like girls are seated in one place only, and the boys are seated. So you find even the the, the way they interact in the class is not very user friendly. So what we do sometimes we mix up, we mix them up so that they can share their ideas, so that they can become more confident on each other. And even in group discussion, you could encourage them to sit in mixed groups. I mean, in mixed genders, so that you can you can have different ideas from both. And that is one of the things that we, we realized that it was important and it has to be captured from the learning outcome themselves, from the way we, uh, we actually uh, prepare our teaching and learning activities as well. Thanks, Loriana. So it's, it's, a really, it's really addressing it at uh, many, many levels, um, but even to the very, the very practical things about um, how people sit in a class and how the um, spaces constructed then. Um, let me turn to Walter to see, let's, let's hear from Walter a bit about um, what you've been doing at Guru to achieve a more inclusive learning environment and what, and what changes you've, you've observed as a result as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, at Guru University, you know, the gender issues are no different from what Glorana just indicated. You find is I mean bias against girls uh, as opposed to boys, and then there we also have issues of law enrollment in science based courses compared to humanities. But also we have issues of sexual harassment towards girls. So at Glue University, the university I'm going ahead uh, to you know put in place gender safeguarding policies, you know that protects the, the girl the vulnerable. Uh, members of the university from you know uh, harassment you know provides also for them for you know involvement and inclusion in each and every activity the university has gone ahead to uh, have as well a gender desk you know with a mandate to streamline uh, you know gender across the institutional programs activities and courses and we are not we're talking about not only uh, you know having a gender course unit in the curriculum which is now mandatory across all programs but also inclusion of gender gender responsive you know initiatives you know when it comes to community engagement it comes to you know group discussions comes to university programming 
uh, even creating awareness among staff about you know uh, gender issues. You know, so so these are some of the things that Blue University has done actually to create a, an inclusive learning environment for both boys and girls. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. Um, please do ask any um, questions you might have um, uh, in the chat so that we um, we can pick up on those as we go through the, through the panel. Um, and um, let me just give Gloriana um, a chance now to pick up on on the bit she missed when she um, dropped. So some of your your um, experience with Gloriana at UDOM, um, uh, how have you helped um, students to think and, and have you helped them to um, solve problems through their learning? Well, uh, John, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, when I dropped, I, I couldn't be able to address this. So thank you. Um, actually, uh, on the ways that we used to actually make our students think and solve problems, uh, we started actually, you know, revisiting the courses themselves first because we knew that we cannot practice in the class while the courses themselves they cannot reflect on what we are practicing. So we went back and revised the courses, especially looking at the, you know, the the the, the, the learning outcomes if they speak to our learners, if they they can actually tell that this learner, when you're, when you're learning this course, at the end of the day, you're expecting to become someone or you're expected to do one to three so that they can become employable in the job market. So how do we do this? So we, we started by you know redesigning the courses and looking at the learning outcomes if they are more relevant to what students are learning. But I, again, we actually are to, to see on the ways or the methodology or the teaching approaches that we are using. So to make, we looked into the six types of learning, making students to learn critically. So, you know, all the six learning types, make practice to be able to collaborate and be able to have the things that we looked into fit from this. And we could see the change in, our, in their behaviors on how they approach problems. So we could see that they are becoming more confident on how they can solve those problems. So those were the issues that we had to check and just see if uh, we give some authentic tests that they can prepare these students to be able to, uh, uh, to apply the knowledge they have acquired in the class and apply it in the real life application uh, so that they can, they can have that integration. Um, thanks, way Gloria. of integrating what they have learned in the class and the real world. Thank you. Thanks, I, think we got, I think we got most of you there. There were a couple of um, distortions, but I think we heard, heard most of what you said, which is, which is um, great. And thanks for those really um, useful insights from you, Dom. Um, before we move into the next part of the panel, I, I, I wanted to launch another mentee and see if um, we can hear a bit more from the audience that way. Um, so um, this is our um, final mentee poll. Let's let's see if uh, we can gather a bit more insights from you all uh, this way. Um, what we want to ask is, when you develop your um, courses and your um, teaching programs, to what extent do you engage with employers or with um, communities? Or other stakeholders um, in that uh, process. Um, Patrick, if you could drop us the link in the chat. So you, you should see a Menti link now in the chat. If you click that, um, you'll be able to um, give your thoughts on that question and we'll see them on this on the screen um, shortly. And in the meantime, um, the panel will will um, get ready to answer um, some, some questions about this and talk about what they've done and what they've learned from doing that in their institutions. If you can, if you can access the link, please do um, uh, answer this question on the Mentimeter. Um, when you develop your courses, how much do you engage with employers? or communities and we've got three options here always sometimes or not, not at all just to gauge how much this is a 
a common practice um, in the institutions that you, you represent or the um, programs you teach. We've only got one uh, one vote so far. I'm not sure if this is because of having problems launching the launching the menti, or if we have a bit of a time lag. Um, but at least at least one person in the audience always makes sure to engage employers or communities in the process um, of developing uh, redeveloping courses, um, uh, and somebody else does it some of the time. Quite a few moments to see if we get any more any more votes in. Um, okay, another another for sometimes. Um, it's it's encouraging to see we don't have anyone saying not at all. Um, uh, we want to make sure we have enough time at the end to take any questions that you might have um, and that you've added into the um, chat. So I want to go now to the next part of the panel. Um, which we're going to talk a bit more about this issue of engaging employers or communities in the process. Um, let me start with with um, you, Walter. Um, so this is a this is an issue very um, close to Gulu's heart. Um, with your uh, with your university's whole mission being um, described as for community transformation. So how can university teaching and learning connect connect with the community needs uh, the community needs? Sorry, um, of people in uh, in the Gulu regions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, engaging with the community is part of the core mandate, I think, of all universities. At, at Gulu, as you indicated, we have taken it as head on as part of our core mandate to transform the community. And we, we have done this, you know, by integrating, you know, community engagement in our teaching and learning and project activities. We, we have a model which we call the student-centered outreach model, which guides the you know, engagement of the university with the community. Now for Gulu, you know, the community is every, every institution, every individual which is outside the university gate. You know, a small older farmer, a nearby health clinic, an NGO, a local business, you know, becomes part of the community. So at Gulu University, using the student-centered outreach approach, we, we take our students out to the community, for instance, through community touching, through internship programs, you know, in agriculture, you know, in medicine, in education, in each and every program that we have in those faculties, there's community engagement or attachment or industrial attachment or internship, whatever brand it takes. The idea is to give students the opportunity to experience firsthand what they learn in class in real practice. Now, this way, the community, you know, helps the university to kind of mentor the students, the, the, the graduate they want out there when they leave the university gate. You know, the community also gets involved in teaching, in, 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 in assessing of the students, in mentoring the students. We all know that, you know, soft skills, you know, you know ability to relate, teamwork, you know, ability to, to communicate, timekeeping becomes very important once someone leaves the university. So this is some of the skills we try to ensure that the student gets through their working with the community members. At the university also, we do, you know, community action research projects. These are very focused projects on specific issues that affect the community. It attracts the engagement of the lecturer, but also alongside carries the students to do research on topical issues. You know, we could say particular value chain is research, you know, to ensure that right from production to marketing, there is, you know, we understand what the issues are and we can contribute to that particular development of the value chain. It could be, you know, peace and security in the community. So those become topical issues that directly addresses community issues, but also we involve the students to do their research on that. In that way, you know, the student comes out while knowing that this is how we can address community needs while at the university. And this is how the university can contribute to the development of the community around it. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. So that's that's I'm fascinating to hear that you're actually finding ways for Google to to bring the community and the students together while they're while they're studying and give them practical um, things to do together and to to learn from learn from their community as much as they're learning from their uh, from the academic um, lecturers. Um, uh, Gloriana, um, let's 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 hear from you next. Um, 
how have you at um, UDOM tried to develop more, more sustainable and much more long-lasting connections with, with your um, stakeholders? Because this is, this is something which we often hear that, that um, those kind of relationships are very, are very short-term or they falter, they don't last very long. Well, uh, John, so yeah, to have a long lasting connection with community and employers, uh, UDOM has addressed these issues by, you know, engaging different stakeholders in several discussions, not only in curriculum designing, but uh, we could have some kind of our, from the project we started with joint advisory group uh, our, uh, meetings. But again, we, 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 we thought that this is an idea, this is a good practice to uphold it so that we can have you know, regular uh, meetings with uh, people from the industry, from the policy making bodies, from all those areas so that we can discuss the matters as, as we know that they are the ones that they, they can actually tell us on the needs, of, I mean, the, 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 the job market needs so that we can fit in our our graduates so that we can produce our ideal graduates. So we have been uh, engaging them through those meetings, but again, uh, having them as part of our placement for practical skills of our students. So we, we keep having this connection with industry so that we can place our students when they go for practical trainings uh, after, I mean, every, every year. But again, uh, we are thinking of bringing uh, experts from, from the industry into curriculum design processes, but also as are uh, inviting them as guest lectures so that they can they can actually uh, impart our students with practical skills more. And this is some of the approaches that we are looking forward to continue having them as we continue engaging the community. Thanks, Gloriana. Um, uh, Chipo, turning then finally to Mozambique, and what, what are the challenges you face or universities in Tanzania face in attracting and maintaining these um, kind of partnerships? And um, what, what are the, the changes have you seen in your, in your um, students as a result of those engagements? Thank you, John. Uh, maybe regarding the challenges, first of all, having a budget to support this is the great challenge so far, because now, uh, sometimes it involves maybe let's say uh, moving from one city to another and then sometimes maybe you are uh, taking an expert in a certain area then you need to pay those expert rates so this is somehow a challenge because now uh, probably the university does not have enough fund to support that so it becomes difficult to include these people or maybe to, especially those maybe who are very successful, who can be a good example to the students or bring in uh, good knowledge. Sometimes it becomes difficult to get such kind of people because of uh, lack of fund. But then uh, with uh, Tessea, through the joint advisory group, we were able to meet with several uh, people from the industry. Some of them are very successful people. And then from them also, we are able to come up with some uh, memorandum of understanding so as to come up with uh, like a mutual agreement on how we can both benefit. They can benefit from us, from our students, but then we can also benefit from them uh, maybe doing the like the student placement, but also lecture placement. So challenges are there. And then the other thing is about a lack of clear strategy because when you don't know what you want from, from these people or from the organization community, it's difficult to be able to get the right person, but then also it's difficult to have that mutual understanding that we are talking about. But then I would say at the moment, things are getting better. We are trying, for example, Mzumba is trying to have a defined strategy on how to include the community in teaching and learning process, but then also trying to have this memorandum of, of understanding with different, let's say, industries, SMEs, so that we can work together to improve the teaching and learning of our students. Now, coming to those students who have actually, like have gone through this mode of teaching whereby the community is included or they participate in community uh, as part of teaching and, and, and learning strategy, you find that they are more blended, like they can easily blend to the community once they graduate. It's easy for them to blend to the community because they're already aware of what is happening and they know how things are solved. But then also you find that 
these people, are, this awareness, it also helps them to compete not only in the national level, but also in the international level. So I think it's very important to ensure that this, this, this community engagement to, in the teaching and learning process so as to increase the awareness of these people, but also the confidence itself that they can be able to uh, support or blend with what the market wants. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chupo. Um, and thanks all to and Joriana for your insights too. Um, we've had a couple of um, questions in the chat, which I want to make sure we have um, time to address. Um, the first is from um, Samantha. Samantha, I don't know if you want to um, ask your question directly. Um, please unmute. Sure. Yeah, I was just uh, thank. First of all, thanks so much for the the presentation and the dialogue today. Um, I'm really interested in in kind of the sustainability aspect of. Of the, of the model and, and how faculty members are changing their instructional practices. So I'm just curious if the panelists can talk about how this is being institutionalized at their, at their universities and, and how are you ensuring that like new faculty members or faculty members who aren't participating in these cohorts are also being exposed to um, you know, this new way of, of teaching so that their students are, are gaining skills uh, desired by employers. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks so much. Um, let's let's start. I think as a Gloriana, Gloriana might be keen to pick up on this one. So thinking, Gloriana, about institutionalizing this for for kind of future groups of lecturers, um, faculty. Well, yeah. Thank you, Samantha, for the question. Actually, um, uh, we have managed to scale up these are uh, the you know from the projects how we we, uh, we, 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 ha we we have had few faculty members being involved in the projects who are, have participated we are able to design their courses but again after that we had to scale up this effect i mean to you know to multiply this effect to other faculty members who did not so that we can institutionalize this so we went further and discussed with the quality assurance uh, uh, directory for reasons for the UDOM, how we did it. So, and, and they, they had to request us to be facilitators so that we can we can have varieties, our faculty members from all the colleges. Initially, we were only piloting this for the three colleges, but later we had to do for the entire university so that they can have a, a, a test of it. So that is how we started. And then we started, you know, moving from one college to the other, you know, imparting them, you know, capacitating them with this kind of uh, transformative way of teaching, you know, and taking them through the course redesigning process, aligning their, 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 their programs with the bigger vision of the university. And so we have been doing that and we are really looking forward to continue uh, practicing as we keep going so that we can have this impact being multiplied uh, in many people and not only for, uh, to the UDOM, or to the University of Dodoma, but to other, to the rest of the universities in Tanzania as well, and to other universities even outside Tanzania. This is what we have been doing. And the university has been buying the idea, so they have been supporting it, and I'm sure that this is a very good way of, you know, getting a buy-in from the universities by embracing the changes. Thanks, Gloriana. Um... Walter or, or Tupo, do, do either of you want to come in on the, on the question of institutionalization? Uh, maybe. Sorry, sorry. Should I go ahead, Walter? Yeah, Tupo, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can just add to what uh, Goriana said. Uh, we also, we have the similar uh, approaches or initiatives which are going on, but then also another thing which we are doing, especially for us who had the chance to participate in a workshop, uh, when the SEA project was still uh, was still going on, we are trying to mentor other people. So whenever we go to, uh, let's say, to, we, we do a workshop, for example, in our campus that is located in Bea or in, in Dar es Salaam, we try to, each of us try to get some people that you can mentor and ensure that they are really doing that. Because what we have learned on the process is that sometimes you can try to do the, I mean, you can deliver a workshop, try to do some, some things, but then people will not do it if they don't have a mentor because we also had mentors. So that, that's why we were able to do that. So we are trying to do to continue with the mentorship program where each person is assigned with some people and then try to follow 
and ensure that you provide them with support. But then also to, to increase pressure, let's say on the management, we try to use this, uh, the student portfolio because now the management, we, we, we demonstrate the portfolio of the students, how they, they, they are learning curve throughout, let's say the program or the course. So the management now is more convinced that this is the good approach and we have to somehow uh, adapt it so that each and every uh, lecturer should use the approach. So these are some of the things that we, we try to do in Mzumbe on top of what Gloriana mentioned. Thank you. And um, thanks to you, uh, Walter, do you want to come in? So your experience of institutionalizing this in the practice of the um, Gulu? Yeah, sure, John. Um, at Gulu University, this year project got us actually on the way. Uh, the model I talk about, the student-centered outreach model was originated from the Faculty of Agriculture, but uh, when Tessia came on board, it took an institutional approach. Uh, at Gulu, uh, we have moved on to integrate this into the strategic plan. Our next uh, five-year strategic plan, which became effective last year, 2021, it asked uh, student-centered outreach and community engagement strongly you know, as a core objective. And within the strategic plan, the, the university is in the process of establishing the community and engagement directorate. To, to further the cause for community engagement, uh, you know, across all faculties and all, all departments. So this is, a, to, to me, a big step in that direction. The gender policy, which uh, we talk about, gender safeguarding policy, has also been institutionalized and approved at the, at the IS uh, organ of the university. Now, within each of the faculties, you know, it's, uh, through the TCR, we are able to train, of course, like uh, my two colleagues have indicated, but it is now part and parcel of every new curriculum that you know the faculties and departments have to embed these innovative teaching approaches, community engagement, gender into all aspects of teaching and learning. So that that is how far uh, at, at Gulu we have gone in terms of institutionalizing uh, these innovative approaches of teaching and learning. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Walter. I just want to try and squeeze in the final question we had from um, Ben. I think we might not have time to. Ben to ask it directly, but the question was, for those faculty who've adopted these new practices um, to engage community partners or to send to their students, have, have any of you used formal evaluation to support reflective practice? So, um, and, if, and if so, um, what have you found useful? I'm not sure if anybody wants to uh, pick up on that question. Um, just unmute yourself if you do. And if not, we'll try and follow it up later, uh, Ben, um, offline. Yeah. Maybe um, if I can try to respond on that. Okay. Yeah. Go on, Walter. Uh, from from my, from Google University perspective, if I understand this question, we, we have done follow up studies, especially on our community and engagement approach. We have also follow done follow up, uh, uh, you know, studies. Uh, not a, a formal study this time, but uh, with students' uh, individual interviews with the changes in teaching approaches and the outcome has been very positive. The community engagement approach, for instance, has uh, indicated to us that the employability, the acceptability of our graduates in the job market is very high. And you know, the students getting employed within month upon graduation or even before graduation, just complete the course. And a number of employers indicate that, you know, they are very practical and they're very handsome. So it gives us an indication that it's actually working positively for us. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. And um, we've got about a minute left, so I, I don't want to run us right to the uh, to the cutoff point. I just want to thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, we've put a link in the chat, um, and I believe it's on the platform, but that's uh, transformhe.org, where all of the materials we've developed um, and lots of case studies and information about what we've we talked about today will be available. Um, or if you want to find out more, just um, drop us an email. Um, I, um, again, there's a link on the website to go to email us um, and um, or you can find us at our institutional um, websites and I'll just drop my email um, in the chat in case you've, you've, you've missed any of this um, and, and can't find the website, but it should be um, uh, all in the uh, summit platform too. And thank you very much and um, I'm very keen to talk to anybody who wants to find out about how these uh, approaches and methods might be useful at their institutions.